In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, there are times when words fall short, and this week is one of them, I would say. As you know, on Tuesday, an 18-year-old entered a fourth grade classroom in Texas and started shooting children and teachers. So 21 are dead, and 17 are wounded, and countless others are scarred for life. I don't want to have to talk about this today. I mean, I don't ever want to have to talk about this kind of atrocity again. I'm sick of it. After Uvalde and Buffalo and all the other places whose names we've been hearing in the news this past week, I want to be done talking about shoppers massacred in grocery stores and fourth graders being gunned down at their desks. I I have no words to make this better. And at the same time, there are moments when words must be spoken, regardless of how they fall short. For when we're lost, you know, wandering in the darkness, we need to remember who we are and whose we are and what that means for us. So I'd like to invite us to start by offering God our pain in this week and our compassion for the people of Uvalde through this prayer from the Episcopal Bishop of West Texas, David Reed. So let us pray. O God, our Father, whose whose beloved Son took children into his arms and blessed them, give us grace to entrust your beloved children of Uvalde to your everlasting care and love and bring them fully into your heavenly kingdom. Pour out your grace and loving kindness on all who grieve. Surround them with your love and restore their trust in your goodness. And we lift up to you our weary, wounded souls and ask you to send your Holy Spirit to take away the anger and violence that infect our hearts and to make us instruments of your peace and children of your light. In the name of Christ, who is our hope, we pray. Amen. So I'm tempted now just to read the names of the victims and have us sit here for a few minutes in silence. But in this tragic week, we also marked a kind of peculiar major feast of the church, the the Feast of the Ascension, as well, of course, as celebrating Memorial Day weekend. Now, the, you know, the Ascension of the resurrected Jesus might seem to have nothing whatsoever to do with this tragedy that our nation's bearing. In fact, the cynics might look at this odd juxtaposition of events and holidays and, and conclude that indeed Jesus must have ascended back to heaven because he sure as heck isn't preventing the carnage that we inflict on each other here. Of course, that cynicism reflects bad theology because God has never been in the business of preventing the carnage that we inflict on each other. Instead, God inhabited our world as Jesus Christ, inaugurating a kingdom of love in contrast to the kingdom of sin and violence that surrounded him. In fact, allowing himself to be sacrificed to sin and violence in order to defeat them by rising from the grave. You know, Jesus isn't about dragging us out of the kingdom of death. He's about giving us a different reality to choose, the reality of the reign and rule of God. And in fact, one of the reasons the Feast of the Ascension is important is because it reminds us that God's contrast reality isn't just a nice idea, you know, a vision of peace and harmony to comfort us. This contrast reality is the present active dominion of the Prince of Peace. The central claim of the Ascension is not that Jesus up and left, you know, heading back to heavenly tranquility. The, 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 The central claim of the Ascension is that Jesus is Lord of the universe, our cosmic CEO, if you will, you know, the one to whom our glory and our allegiance must go. Now, it's true that Our Creator has empowered us with free will, you know, the ability to turn against the King because 
love can't be commanded. Okay, but we turn against the king at our own peril, individually and as our broken nation. I think what we see around us is the consequence of the perspective that I was talking about last week, actually, seeing ourselves as independent actors, each with the correct answer to any question and the right to exercise our beliefs as we darn well see fit, by golly. Well, yes, okay, liberty is certainly a gift from God, but as St. Paul said, you know, take care this liberty of yours does not become a stumbling block to others. We, we've, come so, we've come to believe so deeply that we are right and others are wrong and we can do whatever we want that I fear we are losing our memory of how to care for one another, how to nurture the common good. I, I think this is our particularly American affliction of original sin, actually. That the deep down, we each think we know best and we have the right to act on it. And, and the more we live that way, the less we can see Jesus beckoning us to follow his reign and rule instead. Now, seeing the reality of Jesus' heavenly reign among us, that, that can be hard. Tricky, in fact, because our world conspires against it, turning God's reality on its head. So to flesh that out a bit, I want to I share an image with you that I, I think I've mentioned before. So as a kid growing up in Springfield, Missouri, my family and I went to Silver Dollar City just about every year, at least once, maybe more than that. So at this 1880s style amusement park, one of the earliest attractions there, it's been there forever, is a fun house called Grandfather's Mansion. Any other Grandfather's Mansion fans here? Thank you very much, all right. So the stairs make you lean at odd angles and the hallways sort of tip you sideways, messing with your equilibrium. The, the portraits on the wall change from faces of kindly elders to demonic monsters, depending on where you stand. You, you, you sit on what looks like a level bench in front of you and then tumble into the person sitting next to you. You, you, you turn on a faucet and the water runs uphill. But maybe the most compelling sight is looking through a window into grandfather's bedroom. So literally everything in it is upside down. The, the bed's on the ceiling with the, the bedspread hanging upwards. And a chandelier sticks up from the floor. Uh, a water pitcher and a bowl are stuck to a dressing table hanging from the ceiling. And, and a clock's running counterclockwise with a long pendulum sticking up from the bottom, arcing back and forth in the air the wrong way. Now, as a kid walking through Grandfather's Mansion, I, I first found this place deeply disorienting, even frightening, and I wanted to get out because I was afraid of what twisted reality I might encounter next. But if you spend enough time in Grandfather's Mansion, your equilibrium sort of adapts, and you can make your way through the off-kilter hallways and you know, down the tipping stairs without really much stumbling. And with repeated visits, of course, Grandfather's Mansion becomes familiar territory. You know, you, you don't even need to think too much about readjusting your equilibrium in order to make it through this upside-down world. I think we're living in Grandfather's Mansion. And more to the point, I think we're choosing to live in Grandfather's Mansion. And in fact, we've spent so much time in Grandfather's Mansion that we think it's reality. The clocks run backwards and water runs uphill. That's normal now. And it's long past time for us to make our escape. In this, this land of disfigured priorities, a place where me being right matters more than us being safe. This land is not our home. 
Jesus, our true Lord, invites us to remember that we're citizens of a different land, a heavenly country, which, by the way, specifically does not mean just a promise of peace out in the sweet by and by. It means a responsibility to follow the Prince of Peace in the here and now, in this twisted reality we've created, turning toward his reign and rule instead. So what would that look like? Can we even picture it? Well, I think it would look like our leaders taking those rituals of failure that I mentioned last week and transforming them into kingdom moments, seizing God-awful times like this week and redeeming them by choosing to turn in a different direction. So here's a tiny example, a microscopic example. There was an article in the Star this past Wednesday, buried way down at the bottom of the feed. You know, it, it, it wasn't full of emotion or conflict, no, no police lights or scandal involved. It was a guest commentary from Bob Boydston, who is the retired sheriff of Clay County with 34 years experience in law enforcement. And the title of his article was, Don't Say We Can't Fight School Shootings. Clay County and North Kansas City Schools Have a Plan because they do. And the article outlines it. So what they're suggesting, what they're moving toward, um, focuses on achieving, well, something that might actually be possible to achieve in this moment. You know, first steps that could make a difference. Specifically, their idea is that they would put retired law enforcement officers into schools at all levels for protection. Now, this enhanced protection would be expensive, right? You've got to pay them. How do you fund it? Well, they propose funding it by taxes on firearms at the point of importation and manufacture and sale, as well as taxes on video games that are all about killing people. And that tax revenue also would be used to strengthen state mental health services. Hmm. Now, I say this not because this proposal is the answer to gun violence, because it's not. But I raise this up because it's one escape window from Grandfather's Mansion. You know, it, it's people coming together in a specific place to do what they can to reduce gun violence and make people safer. Now, if we asked our cosmic CEO, the Prince of Peace, whether this is enough, Jesus would say, of course not. <laughs> but it's something, right? You know, a step toward prioritizing the safety of the vulnerable, putting the well-being of the community ahead of the demands of the extremes. And that sounds to me like a turn toward the reign and rule of God. I, I just think we've got to start climbing out of Grandfather's Mansion sometime. And we're not going to find the way out by staring up to heaven, you know, like the disciples watching Jesus ascend. I mean, ultimately, yes, Jesus will return in the same way as you saw him go into heaven, as the angels say today. And we might want to think about the consequences for those who ignore his directions now. Because the Lord of the universe, our, our CEO, has already issued his orders for dealing with evil as, as we encounter it awaiting his return in glory. He's deputized you and me. As Jesus said in the reading from Acts and in today's gospel, you are his witnesses. I mean, we're the proclaimers of the reign and rule of God in the here and now, us. And interestingly, both the principles of our American democracy and the principles of God's kingdom point us in the same direction on this one. That we, the people, bear responsibility to end the madness of one mass shooting after another. You know, we were not given this nation to turn it into a land where clocks run backwards and rivers run uphill. We are citizens of a better country than that, and it's time for us to insist on it. 
Because at the end of the day, we're truly citizens of an even better country. That is a heavenly one. And it's time for us to act that way. 